All right, so then the stripper Lois rips off her sunglasses, and Superman's all, "Oh my God, it's Lois!" <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, hi everybody. Welcome to another issue of Back Issues. I am Tiny, your host. With me, as always, is Adam. Adam, how are you today? I am doing great, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm surprised my camera came back on. Yay! <laughs> yes, oh, that's exciting news. That always that's always a plus. I was really worried. Um, I'll see. There it goes. Uh, my uh, that that actual uh, lo- that joke right there. That's an original. <laughs> it, it came from a skit I wrote where uh, Superman, Batman, and Peter Parker are at a strip joint, <laughs> and like they're complaining about their day. And the stripper comes on stage, and she's got glasses on, and she strips all the way down, and then he whips her glasses off, and he's like, <gasps> Lois. <laughs> like Parker shoots silly string at her, and they're like, "Oh Jesus, Parker!" <laughs> yeah, it was a great bit. We never did it in theater, but we'd always talked about it. Uh, that would have been awesome. Yeah, it was a, it was a whole. I wrote a whole series of uh, superhero skits. It was called Meanwhile. It was other things going on. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it had Bruce Banner waking up with a girl the Hulk had brought home. <laughs> um, Matt Damon at X uh, X Men Academy, and everybody thinks that he's or no Ben Affleck at uh, X Men Academy, and everybody thinks he's Matt Damon. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was a bunch of them. That would have been. Anyways, that's, uh, that's what we're doing here on the back issues. We're dealing with the comic book world, and uh, what a great world it is, isn't it? It is. I mean, there's so much. There's so much good stuff out there. You know, the the stigma of you know you, comic book geeks used to be you know mocked and ridiculed, but now. You look at uh, look at the box offices lately. You look at all the stuff that's coming out. You know, geeks are taking over the world. Man, Beyonce said girls rule the world, but I think it's geeks. I think so too. I think we're taking over. And um, these books, um, one of them is extraordinary. It is a masterpiece. Uh, it was one of the, it was a privilege to read it. And yeah. one of them is um, from the creator of Preacher. And uh, you come <laughs> to expect a few things from him. And this yeah. book delivers in spades. It's so funny. And that, that's uh, the thing it, about Garth Ennis, too. I mean, Garth Ennis, you know, his his writing style is all over the place. He will write something as, you know, he'll write war stories, you know, about World War II and things like that. Then he'll turn around and write something like The Pro. And then he'll yeah. go and do, he'll do Hitman and The Boys. And, you, I mean, you got, there's always that little bit of humor. But in some of those books, man, he goes off. Like, that humor is just, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's third grade, you know, juvenile humor. But... Man, does he elevate it to an art form? It is. It is. I, I realized when I was reading the pro, and uh, we'll get into the, what it's about in a minute. But when I was in, when I was reading it, I started to realize how sick of an individual I am that I found all this hysterical. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I I remember when I read the solicitation for the book in in previews years and years and years ago when the first thing came out and it was a super powered prostitute, and I'm like, I'm in. You yeah, know, I don't care who wrote it. You got me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a full-on, what's it called? The Adele moment. Hello, you yeah. got me. Um, <laughs> Darren Armstrong said that. I want to give him all the credit. That's his joke. <laughs> That's good. I have to remember that one. If I steal from somebody, I'm going to give him credit, especially nowadays. Yeah, you kind of have um, to. So, I mean, you know, everyone's watching everybody these days. I did learn today that our Google on air is going away. And um, it? it's going to switch to YouTube Live, which I don't exactly know how to run yet. <laughs> so I until September 12th to figure out how to turn all of this over to YouTube Live. And I'm sure there will be no disruption in our broadcast. Yeah, well, we'll handle it. All right. <clears throat> maybe too many people complain about Google. <laughs> maybe. Uh, good. Maybe maybe we can find something better. <laughs> Let's hope um, so. I mean, it's not that bad. It's done pretty well for us. No, yeah. In the beginning, it was a little rocky, but you know, once we figured out what we were doing, it got better. Did you need a laptop? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it there. Um. So yeah. Um. So we'll we'll figure that out. But let's uh, let's take another pro. All right. So um, this little book is uh, like I said, about a prostitute who gets uh, special powers from the, a viewer. <laughs> the viewer. An alien in a cloaked device hovering above the earth watching. Uh, he has a, a sarcastic robot sidekick who calls him the voyeur <laughs> and quick to correct him. It's the viewer. It's the viewer. Yeah, the viewers, uh, the viewers got this idea that anybody under the right circumstances can be a, can be a hero. You know, this is, this is like some big experiment to him, you know, to see 
how people would react, you know, given put in these situations. And, you know, he feels that anybody, even, you know, the worst, you know, the people in the worst situations possible, like the, the situation we find our main character in. Our main character who has no name. <clears throat> no, she's never named. She's the pro. Um, she is a lady of the evening. And she has a small child. That yeah, I mean, the, the, she does and, she, not and she's diaper of. And she is, uh, she seems to have crap luck when it comes to her clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, the, uh, her first John is uh, trying to, to, to negotiate after the fact. And uh, I didn't know that was practice you could do. I, I didn't I've either. Never really been in the uh, in that area of expertise. So maybe we should find somebody <laughs> that has. It's a research uh, got, project. There we go. I, I've been hit on by him in Vegas. You know, like come up and, you know, cute girl comes up, talks to me in Vegas. I'm pretty sure she's a hooker. <laughs> she's trying to start a transaction. Yeah. Right. There's no, there's no other way. I'm a huge, giant, scary individual. And pretty girls just don't walk up on me like, hey, how are you tonight, handsome? Get the fuck yeah. out of here. <laughs> I don't have that kind of money just laying around. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on YouTube for free. <laughs> yeah. So she, uh, yeah. So she, she doesn't take it well when the guy tries to uh, to to work her down. And then, um, yeah. So he ends up actually pulling a gun on her, and um, you know, I, he did not like uh, the fact that he had to pay for what he thought was a uh, mediocre service. Mediocre. You know, <clears throat> complaining that he had to wear a rubber the entire time. But again, all this was negotiated up front before, before this the action started. I, I, I would assume that all those kind of things are negotiated up front. You think so? I mean, it, it is a business I I transaction. Certainly, God, see, we, we we need to do more research. We really do. Can I get this past my girlfriend? Like, honey, I had to do research, so we <laughs> had to go sleep with the hookers. There you go. It's okay. Yeah, so she ends up she ends up running from her life from this guy who's firing blindly at her. And uh, yeah, that's the that's the first time we see her interacting with clients, and uh, it kind of sets the tone for this character for the rest of the story, right? And she picks up the baby at a childcare that she was supposed to be there at midnight, and she gets there at two, and they're not happy. <coughs> Excuse me, takes the kid home and uh, it just cries all the time, <laughs> yeah. And all she does is curse at it, and um, in true Garth Ennis fashion, the cursing is. It's on a mystical level. Yeah, I mean, this guy, I don't know where he comes up with some of the stuff, man, but, the, but you know, some people, you, you use cursing too much, and sometimes it just kind of become, you kind of get desensitized to it, but not with Garth Dennis. I mean, Garth Dennis uses it almost poetically. He does. He really does. Um, I found I was watching Roadies this week, and uh, Ron White dropped motherfucker, and I was like, oh, my God, that was the coolest use of that word I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I was like, I did it on the show the other day, and I was like horrified that I'd said it. I was like, oh my god, what did I do? <laughs> and I did it again, and <laughs> but it was an explanation. Yeah, but yeah, Garth Ennis's level of, of cursing it's it's at an all time high. I mean, it's there's no one that can curse like that. It may no, be I mean, I, I don't. It was, he's pretty close. You weren't, yeah. I mean. But yeah, I mean, even if you look at like books like Preacher, I mean, some of the cursing that goes on in that book, you know, is, I mean, extraordinary. It is. It's fantastic. You know, the the first issue of um, Family Storyline where Jesse's confronting Grandma, that whole like one page like massive rant of him just like cursing at her, is. I mean, that was one of the first things from Preacher I ever saw, and I'm like, holy shit, this is ridiculous. And so, um, so she gets um, these superpowers from the viewer in the middle of the night. Yeah, they in come. The they uh, wakes up and kind of has this super team outside of Earth that's made up of assorted um, lame characters: Speedo, I mean, the Lime. They, yeah, they're. I mean, it's just a pretty much like a bad Justice League ripoff. The you know, Justice, the, Saint, the League of Honor, right? The League of Honor. Yeah, but you've got the Saint, who's Superman, the Knight and Squire, who's Batman and Robin, the Lady is Wonder Woman. The Lime is Green Lantern and Speedo is Aquaman. Right. You know, and it, I mean, it's almost, I mean, it's just taking you know, these characters and making as much fun of them as possible. A full, a full parody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's nothing about this book to be taken seriously. No, because, and she's like, I don't want to be in your little stupid superhero gang, and, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, she, she, even, you know, she, she ends up, you know, busting her alarm clock and, and, and nightstand, 
you know, when they when they knock on the window, she ends up ripping the whole thing off the wall, and you reala- then she starts realizing what's going on when these when these uh, you know perverts in, in costumes show up and try to recruit her. And I love uh, so she she reluctantly joins the gang, and they give her an outfit that that kind of shows a little uh, a ring and nipple, a little bit, a little, little bit of action, a little bit. And uh, their first fight is my is the best. Uh, they're they're fighting against the verb, the adjective, the noun, and the pronoun. The pronoun, horrible superheroes, and they're fighting them at the UN. <laughs> she, she does this mega titty twister on the ground. After she gets after she gets laser blasted in the stomach. Right, gets laser blasted in the stomach. Does a titty twister on her, drops her through the roof, and beats the living crap out of her in front of the United Nations. And then pees on her. <laughs> and then proceeds to just give her a golden shower right there in front of the entire assembled United Nations panel with children present. Children, everybody. The League of Honor is aghast that such behavior could actually exist. But in a, in a Garth Ennis world, people get this peed is, on. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is normal for Garth Ennis. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love... I don't remember if it was before or after, but like the interaction when they realize what it is that she actually does for a living, <clears throat> you know, like this whole League of Honor is just like taken aback that somebody would would do this for money. <laughs> How do you just sell yourself? So, um, in order to, uh, I guess we can move forward, right? Yeah. In, in order to to show the uh, the Saint Superman, yeah, um, you know what it is that she does. She asks him if he's ever had a BJ. Well, course, there, there's a reason why she's there. There's a reason why she wants to, you know, after we, you know, after that first fight, she goes back and um, she decides she wants to get a little revenge on, on the client from the beginning of the story. Now that she's got superpowers, um, she figures she can uh, enact some revenge. So, uh, you know, she has one of her one of her friends, you know, find this guy, and then you know rips uh, rips the car door off, pulls him out of his car, rips the pants maker. off. And then just had there's a line of women waiting to get their to get their revenge on this guy with uh, all various assorted implements of um, of things anal, that are going to be destruction, anal destruction. Yes, and uh, you find out later on um, that yes, his anus was in fact destroyed, destroyed, and it's going to take, going to take something like thirty surgery. Oh wow! For him really to be able to shit normally. Well, you just you just locked out. Oh, was that me? Yeah, yeah, it was you. Oh shit. <clears throat> That's all right. You're okay now. You're back. Everything's fine. Just okay. repeat what you said. Um, yeah, so you know, he shows up later on, uh, looking to to get his revenge because of what she did to him, and he's going on about how he has to wear a colostomy bag and it's gonna take something like thirty surgeries to repair his sphincter, and uh, he is not he is not having a good day. And it gets even worse. Um, he's holding he's holding the pro's baby hostage when the saint decides to show up, and uh, the saint disarms him and and takes the baby from him. And you know you see uh, the pro take wind up and take a swing, and the next panel you see him being led away by paramedics and he has no jaw, no jaw, the whole bottom jaw, Gonzo. It's yeah, actually laying it. on the side of the panel. <laughs> yeah, you see it on you see it like uh, on the ledge of another building across the yeah. street. Fantastic! Uh, and again, th- so I got to forget they want to make it. They wanted to make a movie out of this. Somebody actually pitched this and said, "Hey, this would be a great film. Why don't we make a movie of the pro?" And I assume it would have to be like an R-rated comedy because it, I mean it, it would have to be, and they they suggested Sarah Silverman in lead role, which I could completely understand. Amy Schumer may be better at this. Yeah, point. I, th- I think Silver. Oh yeah, you're breaking up real bad now, buddy. And we're back. Technical difficulties all over the place tonight on a soup. For fun double episode now. Uh, yeah, it's it's been a while since we've uh, since we've had these technical difficulties. Going back to uh, God, the first couple ep- ish episodes of uh, yeah. Santa Podcasts. Um, yeah, we made fun of Google tonight, and now we're paying the price. Um, yeah, so let's just finish up the pro and move on to Orbiter. Um, anyway, let's not ruin the end of the pro. No, no, no. Go no, ahead no. and pick it up. It's a short read. 
Um, it's well worth your time. It, it's hysterical. It's dirty. It's foul. And you can see guys getting peed on. If yeah, if you've if you've got a, a, a twisted <laughs> sense of humor, you will absolutely love this book. Yeah, you know, right. no two ways about it. And you know, just being a Garth Ennis fan, if you're like a preacher, you're you're already a Garth Ennis fan. You just don't know it. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, you know, preachers uh, preachers tame compared to the pro, and the pro's only like ninety pages, maybe at most. So we're gonna um we're gonna we're gonna take next week off of uh the, the back issues, but we'll be back in two weeks with our final installment of Garth Ennis. We're gonna read his uh, comic book run on the boys, seventy two issues, should be a lengthy podcast, but it should be entertaining. The boys, uh, the boys is a great, great book, especially if you don't like superheroes. Yeah, well, I've never read the boys at all, so I'm very excited to dig into something I've never read before. So that's always fun. Yeah, one of the fun things for me about the boys was trying to you know, and it, it wasn't too hard to figure out, but trying to figure out which teams were being parodied by the certain teams that they were going after. Um, gotcha, gotcha. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fun to be had with that book. Um, like I said, a lot of uh, if you, if you're never really a big superhero fan, but you like you know comic books, this is the this is one of those books that will uh, definitely, you know, have you laughing at the superheroes. Cool. I can't wait. I want to dig into it. And uh, it's going to take me a while to get through 72 issues. That's that's the yeah. break. I got I to dig out my uh, my collections, uh, go back and reread it. I, I was, a, few, a couple months ago, I read the first, like, four or five hardcovers. Um, how, many, how many hardcovers are there? Well, there was, there was the, rig- the regular hardcovers, which are only, like, six issues apiece, five to six issues. But I, they put out like the absolute editions, and right. I think those were five of those. And that covers the entire series, including mini series. Right. Well, I got it. I got a digital copy of it. So nice. That's, that's it's good cool. times. <clears throat> All right, let's get to Orbiter. Uh, Orbiter is from Mr. Warren Ellis, and uh, next month, September, will be Warren Ellis month. We're going to tackle his masterpiece, Transmetropolitan, as well as some authority, some planetary. Uh, there's some other stuff to dig into with this guy. He's pretty. He's pretty phenomenal as well. Ornelas is, is one of my favorite favorite writers, uh, right up there with Garth Ennis. Um, Transmetropolitan is probably my absolute favorite graphic novel of all time, um, hands down. Uh, Planetary was also just a damn good read. You know, despite the fact that it took 10 years to do, it was an amazing story. Uh, amazing art, you know, just a really fun uh, piece of storytelling from Warren Ellis. And, uh, you know, like we like we kind of talked about with with uh, the the season of preacher, Warren Ellis stories tend to have that slow burn. They kind of start a little slow, but they pick up. And once they once they find their feet, oh man, that it's just off and running for the rest of the series. Yeah, I was a big fan of. Uh, I think it was Authority was the one with Jack Hawksmore, right? Yeah, yeah, I I, I dug Authority, and uh, so I can't wait to dig through those again. Yeah, Authority um, was fun. Yeah, and the girl who was the spirit of the century, Jenny Sparks. Yeah, Jenny Sparks. Well, yeah, you so. you meet another character. You meet more characters like that in Planetary. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I think I read both. I'm pretty sure I did, but yeah. it, it's been a long time. It was since you know, way back in the days of Costa Soprano. So yeah, that's that was a bit long ago. That was the greatest place to live ever. Swords <laughs> on the walls, comic books everywhere. It was a geek heaven. Yeah, that was good good time so when we were talking about this you said we should read orbiter i had never read it um wow i'm so glad i did what an incredible story see i i was in i mean i've been a fan of warren else at this point but not, when the time the book came out but i was also a big fan of the space program you know growing up nasa was a huge thing i mean um i would you know my school had a a young nasa a young astronauts program because one of uh one of my elementary school teachers uh, was on the list to go up in space on the Challenger. Uh, she were was you, uh, actually. Were you a Lebowski little achiever? <laughs> no, um, no. She was actually the the runner up. Had Krista McCullough not been able to to get on that space shuttle, my second grade teacher would have gotten the call and would have blown up summarily. <laughs> so, yes. uh... so to make up for that, they they ended up NASA ended up sending her a bunch of like teaching materials, and she did a whole. Uh, a whole section on that for like the uh, the gifted kids in 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 the class, um, and that was I mean that kind of helped you know cement my love of space. But um, yeah, I've always had a fascination with with space travel and all that stuff like that. So this book, even before the book came out, you know I was you know so into this, um, and then 
right before the book was supposed to come out, the Columbia disaster happened. Right, and, uh, where the, uh, it, the shuttle that exploded on reentry, right? Yeah. yeah. And so Image decided, you know, in the best interest, and it was a good idea to, to hold the book off and not ship it out. They, uh, I think they held it for like six months. And then Warren Ellis wrote a new introduction to the book talking about how we shouldn't let this disaster stop us from going back into space and you know, how we need to get back out there. Um, I mean, because he's all Warren Ellis, if you've ever read anything by this guy, he loves technology. He loves science. He loves all of this, you know, stuff that's real and, you know, theoretical. So uh, can I just say he also makes it incredibly easy to read. He does. He like, does. For as technical as he gets, it is amazingly easy to keep and to, to follow. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't, you know, sit there and bash you over the head of it and, and, you know, talk like you have to have, you know, a PhD and have worked, spent time at NASA and, you know, all these other tech companies to understand the kind of stuff that he's talking about. He makes it very understandable for everybody. And yeah, that's part except of, I mean, for all the, uh, the acronyms. There's a lot of three letter organizations who's, <laughs> you know, but that's any government thing you get into. There's too yeah. many people with initials. So of course, let's kill all the initials. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk orbiter. So Orbiter is uh, the, the American space uh, program shuts down after the, uh, what is it, the Columbia? The Venture. The, ven well, the, the, the Venture uh, shuttle is the, the, the Jesus the fictional thing. shuttle in this story. Yeah. And after it takes off, it disappears. Yeah, about 10 minutes into its mission, all of a sudden it disappears. And, you know, they lose radio contact, they lose visual. And in the wake of something like this happening, NASA decides to end all Shut manned down. space flight. Shut down all manned space flight programs, and we go back to the days of rockets, which is kind of where we're at now. Yeah, where a bit. We, we are shooting off way more unmanned Elon Musk and SpaceX is doing things, but the NASA itself, there's not a whole lot of, uh, we don't have a shuttle program anymore, right? Not anymore, no. Yeah. So, 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 the, so the story picks up 10 years after the venture has disappeared. Kennedy Space Center has kind of become like a shanty town. It's, it's kind of like a big homeless shelter. Yeah. Um, you know, you, people just live in their lives in the, in the shadow of this building that was once, you know, the center of NASA's, you know, manned spaceflight program. And all of a sudden, 10 years after its initial launch, the venture returns to Earth. And does it return in epic fashion? Um, it's pretty epic. It destroys the shanty town bad. Yeah, um, pretty much everybody that was living there has been, you know, crushed by shuttle reentry. Um, yeah, it's just brutal. And the the panels in this book, they're uh, beautiful artwork. Uh, just so Colleen, beautiful. Colleen Duran, yeah, she did an amazing job on the art oh, with this book. So the, the shanty town is ruined, and um, it turns out there is one crew member alive inside the venture. Yeah. Um, the first thing, the first thing is, is, you know, we see, you know, the government start to put together a team to figure out what happened because nobody can explain why the ship who, you know, and they even go into detail how the, the way the shuttle's designed, they've got enough fuel for about 20 minutes of burn and have, at, once that happens, you know, the, the, the bells on the back will have been disintegrated because they can't handle that kind of stress. And there's no way a, a shuttle could have disappeared for 10 years and returned with what it was initially sent out with. So they, they start putting together a team and um, you know, we meet the main players of the story um, versus uh, Michelle Robeson, who was one of the only members of the astronaut corps that has left. I think she is, she's mentioned as the last living astronaut. Yeah, she's the last person to have gone into space prior to uh, the venture disappearing. Uh, we meet Dr. Terry Marks, who works for NASA's Breakthrough Propulsion you know, Division. And uh, Anna Bracken, who is the last member of the NASA psych evaluation team, who was there to, you know, talk to, talk to the astronauts once they came back. Yeah, which job would you want? Um, probably uh, the psych evaluation team. Really? See, I, I like the, uh, the theoretical guy. It's kind of, uh, it's uh, Malcolm from uh, Jurassic Park and this chaos theory. I like that. Oh, yeah, guy. no, I mean, the, the, the ideas behind the, you know, in the breakthrough propulsion idea, you know, all the stuff, you know, that they've, they've theorized and whatnot. I mean, it's amazing ideas, but I don't know if, you know, I, I kind of like Anna's point of view where, you know, she knew she was never going to go into space. So she wanted to live it through other people's experiences. Yeah. Did you ever, uh, did you ever cast this in your head when you were reading it? Do you remember that? I didn't. Um, I did. Cause it, like I said, it's fresh for me. So okay. I got to do that. 
Yeah, and I used for, uh, for Michelle Robeson. I used uh, Michonne from The Walking Dead. Okay, I like that. I love her. I used Jennifer Garner for Anna. All right. And um, I had uh, Bradley Whitford, a young Bradley Whitford for Terry Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I had to replace a young yeah. Bradley Whitford. Yeah. Shaggy, shaggier hair, more eccentric, but a very young version of that. I kind of like the way he could deliver it, and that's kind of how I heard him. Yeah, okay, I, I, I could buy that. All right. So they assemble this team to find out, you know, what's going on with the shuttle, and they start in, investigating it. Really, yeah. The uh, the general, uh, the the colonel or whoever it was, brings them together, and he starts, you know, letting them know what what has been found before they even got there. Um, right. And you know, and there's. The, there's some weird, weird shit going on with the shuttle. Some weird stuff. Yeah, the shuttle has grown a skin. Yeah, it is covered in some kind of skin. And the, the, the colonel says, as they were uh, hosing the children out of the wheel housing, um, they found dust. And upon examination, found out that this dust came from the surface of Mars. Right. So apparently the shuttle had landed. And uh, the captain of the shuttle, Captain Cold, is in an interrogation. <laughs> captain Cold? <laughs> that was his name, right? Cost. Cost. I'm sorry, cost. That's close. Kept gold. Cost. It was four letters. I was, I was really close. Gotta give me that one. Yeah, that's a that's a flash villain you're talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it would have been a much more interesting book. If that would have been up. Cooler, right? Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> cost. Um, he's kind of catatonic and crazy. Yeah. And um, uh, they're not you, talking you're... to him much. They got him isolated in a room, and they got the psychiatrist Anna there, and she's gonna go in there, and uh, she's gonna work him over a little bit. Yeah, she's gonna do what she does, and so she tries to uh, to take him back to a safe place to to get him to a calmer time, so we can start, you know, she can start building a rapport with him at least to kind of start working him out of this, you know, state he's been. I mean, you figure the guy's been alone for ten years, flying through the solar system, flying through who knows how far that shuttle went in the span of ten years. Right. You know, and that's exactly where we get um, farther along. Yeah. It's exactly where he went. It's crazy. Yeah, so he, he's allowed to be a little kooky, of course. And and in the process of of trying to you know work him through this, he ends. She ends up taking accidentally taking him back to the venture mission. And uh, as he's recounting this whole thing, you start hearing that everything is going wrong. That pretty much every warning that the shuttle has built into it is going off simultaneously. Right, it's a, and, a uh, mad shutdown of all systems. Yeah. And then that's about that's where that left about at that point is something we knew something catastrophic happened and we don't know what. And here's the thing: it, this book is not it's it's kind of like a thriller, but it's not, and it's no. kind of like a drama, but it's it's a very uh, deliberate track, and they're gonna find out what happens, and they don't hide the information; it comes right to you. Yeah, you I mean it, it's a piece at a time, and there's no big, you know, there's no fights and nothing like that. No, it's a, it's a, it's a very short story. It's it's um, you know, and the, the way I always looked at it is like this is Warren Ellis's love letter to the space program and to just to outer space itself. You know, this is a guy that has been fascinated by this, and this was just his, you know, sharing his love of this with everybody else. Yeah, and that's an amazing that's an amazing way to put it. Um, I don't have any any era, I guess, where I have that much of a passion for it. Yeah, you know, I'm not a wild west. Maybe gangsters. I I, I love the mafia a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, serial killers. I'm really into them. But um, hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not. Yeah. All right, so, so go we, ahead. So we're cutting back to you know to the various crews. Um, you know, uh, Anna before she went and talked to to Mission Commander Cost. Um, I saw a video of the of the military when they first went and entered the shuttle and it was very weird. You know, they talked about how, you know, they felt like their weight had doubled, their legs had given out on them. And when Anna goes and talks to Terry, the breakthrough propulsion guy, and she starts relaying this to him, all of a sudden he starts having ideas as to what, what it was that actually made the ship able to land on Mars and to go to points further known, um, unknown. And here's um, I believe the thing that, that, that Warren Ellis asks you as the reader to um, do is is basically you have to um, assume that physics doesn't exist. No, I mean, and and these and these theories that he he proposes in these books, these are all real theories. I mean, these are all things that people have discussed and and theorized, and you know, the potential for this stuff to exist is out there. 
it's not just completely made up. It's not like, you know, you look at Stan Lee when he first started creating all these superheroes. He was making all this shit up. You know, Warren Ellis, all of the stuff he's got in here is all based on, you know, on theories and papers that have been written and, you know, evidence that suggests that these things could exist. And it's it's not it's not even wormhole, but it's kind of like that. Yeah, uh, but I believe there, there's a lot of theory in the book that that are it is it is fringe science. It is science that what if gravity wasn't as absolute as we think, or what if space and time were not exact, you know, absolute like we think. Yeah, and I, I believe in this book he uses what's called a bias drive, which is something that you know there is a a, a object within the shuttle that has so much it creates its own gravity so much so that it actually rewrites the laws of physics around it um and you know it, it sounds like a crazy idea to kind of wrap your head around but he he explains it in such a way that you know someone like me could understand right it was, you know? does it how fast does it go it's faster than light speed yeah you, you know, know if, you, if, if you could if you could if you could convince the universe that you didn't exist in that bubble then you know the laws of the universe and time and space and you know everything didn't apply to you. You know they because they, they talked about how this guy had been in space for ten years and he showed no signs of you know, of any kind of microgravity damage, which right. you know which is uh, a scientific thing that happens to astronauts in zero g. Yeah, your muscles start to deteriorate because there is no there you know there isn't gravity to kind of to keep them working like they would. But they this guy's been fucked that he appeared like younger. Yeah, he 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 seemed like almost five years younger, and you know, this, when you get into to light speed travel and relativistic travel, um, how when you're moving faster than the speed of light, you're you're not moving as fast as time around you, you know, um, and that's another thing, you know, that when it comes to time to to light speed travel, you've got like the Star Wars things where it's just like okay, time moves normally as you're traveling at light speed, and you've got things like Ender's Game where. As you're moving in light speed, you're you're moving at a fraction of the time around you. Whereas while you may be gone for two weeks, fifty years has passed around you. Right, and that, you know, yeah. So the, he he doesn't know that he's been gone for ten years. Um, I don't think. Yeah, I don't know if it's ever really explained if he realizes just how long he's been gone. To me that way. No, but he but, um, knows he did, he did see a lot of stuff in his grand tour of the universe. He did see an awful lot of stuff. So Anna, the, the psychologist, gets it in her noggin that it's not necessarily him that she needs to dig in, but she tells, she relates the stories of the three people that she's working with uh, yeah. back to, to the catatonic captain and says, yeah. you know, when, when this happened, when the venture went missing, it took away Michelle's chance to be in space and to be an astronaut. And it took away the space program, so there was no reason for Terry to think the incredible things that his mind thinks of. And there was no reason for her, who just wanted to live through the, the what the astronauts had seen and, and just, you know, in their minds. So it really took all of uh, their three stories and put it to him in a personal manner. And that opens him right up. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a great scene, too, you know, where she's just explaining, yeah, what the loss of the space program had taken away from from not just them but from everybody i mean she she focused it on those three but you know there were so many people that lost out by the discontinuation of that program um yeah i, think I mean we all did i mean every one of us in some way loses something by not being there yeah you know, i mean it, it's just the 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 curiosity of of is you know are we alone in the universe blah 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 yeah and Plus, we, we, we have, you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX do, saying we're going to Mars and we're going to set a thing up and you're going to be able to vacation and party there. Well, fuck right. We want to do that. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the last unexplored frontier that we have. I mean, with telescopes and stuff like that, we've been able to see a lot of it, but we, we've only seen a fraction of what's out there. We've also only seen a fraction of what's in our oceans, but. Yeah, exactly. I mean. I might want to start at home. You know what I'm <laughs> I don't know if I want to vacation live. on the bottom of the ocean, though, you know? Figure out where you live before you go, hey, let's go to a, a more exotic destination. Yeah, so, um, so, so at this point, he starts opening up and tells the story, and you can go ahead from here. Yeah, so I mean, so at this point, you know, uh, Terry and Michelle have pretty much figured out what has happened to the ship as far as what's been done to it. They, they, they find the evidence of this bias drive, this you know super dense gravity you know material that is that has you know caused it to be able to land on mars and to to shoot out from points unknown 
in a matter of seconds. Um, it's basically zero propulsion. Yeah, yeah no friction. Or zero energy propulsion. Or friction. Yeah, they, des they describe it as a blob of oil on a on a Teflon skillet. You know, there's no friction whatsoever. Um, so so once they once they've you know once Commander Cost realizes you know that they kind of know what's going on, he you know he kind of comes out of it. and He's like, look, he's like, I need to get back to my ship. You know, I want to show you. I want to show you this thing. And uh, so all three of them, all four of them actually start heading back towards towards the, the shuttle. And he's explaining, you know, what uh, what it is that actually happened. That once they uh, once they got out of you know once they got towards the moon, they were pulled away to the dark side of the moon by a group of aliens. And uh, these oh, aliens. You said aliens. I said aliens. I think this is probably the part, like the weirdest part of the story, and this is not even that weird. It's not even that weird <laughs> compared to what they've already gone and given you. This is like okay, yeah. And 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 this is, I mean, this is probably one I, one of my favorite parts of the story is that you know, he describes these aliens as you know, kind of like children. You know, they they wanted to make space less lonely for people. They like wanted they want us to come play. Yeah, they they were they were waiting for for the people of Earth to to be able to have the technology to explore further. And, uh, you know, when that didn't happen, they took the shuttle and they gave them the opportunity. Um, the other six members of the crew went back home with the aliens to, to see what it was they had over there. And John, being the commission commander and the pilot, you know, he had to stay with the ship. So, you know, he's, they said his job was the one he had to, to go home and show them the way. And that's exactly what it was. You know, they, they sent him on a tour and said, look, if they haven't come out looking for you by then, you know, when you get back, it's your job to give these people the tools to come back out here and explore. Right, and they give them like an auto drive um, Uber trip around the galaxy, basically, where he gets to see everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, stuff that I'm sure, you know, uh, our satellites and our cameras and telescopes, you know, will never, ever see, Right. you know. And so you can imagine when he came back if he was a little squirrely. Yeah, I mean. That, that's lots of things. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, and like I said, you know, being alone for 10 years, probably, uh, you know, have a little bit of mental effect on you. If you don't have anybody to talk to you and, you know, no interaction with anybody for for that long, it's going to it's gonna have some some effect on, on your personality. I know some of you think it would be like paradise <laughs> that you could not talk to people. And I I'm, might be one of them that would just be like, oh, 10 years of no one. <laughs> but... It would. It would get awfully lonely, and you, you'd start to crack up. I'd, I'd figure you'd go Tom Hanks, Wilson, and the, the beach, or the volleyball. Probably. Yeah. Probably. And I mean, if I was in space, I'd certainly create something I could throw around the cabin and, you know, talk to. <laughs> so, what the heck? Might as well pick up somebody on the way. I'm sure there's other life out there. Maybe. Maybe he did have some experiences. We didn't, we didn't ever heard about that. Maybe. I mean, did he go for the green chick? The, he, everybody does. Everybody does, and, and I, well, I love the part you know, as as you know they get onto the shuttle and you know cost starts powering the whole thing up. Terry Marks runs out and he grabs the girl that you know was working on his team. And he's like, "Look, he's like, I got nothing to offer you. I've got no money, you know, no prospects." He's like, "But something really, really cool is about to happen, and I want you to see this." And she's like, "Okay," you and, know. Uh, so they take off. They 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 return to go get the uh, seven astronauts that were left behind. And that's where the book ends. That is where the book ends. I mean, it's you know, just, it, it, it's such a sweet and hopeful story. It is. Uh, I mean, like I said, you know, the first time I read this book, you know, I put it down and I'm just like, I was kind of in awe just of this 96 page love letter. Um, you know, and I'd read Transmetropolitan, you know, a handful of times at this point, and I love that book, but this was, this was like a, a, a different side of Warren Ellis, you know, um, I mean, this was like, this is the guy that the, who wanted to share his passion with the readers, you know, and you realize just how much he really loves all the stuff that he's writing about in this book. And it's, uh, like, it's like listening to Cameron Crowe write about music. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you have somebody that's that passionate about something that is willing to share it with you, you know, to share such an intimate detail of their life, something that's, that, is, that means that much to them. I mean that you know that doesn't happen all the time, and when you when you do, you, you've got to enjoy that. It's it's an amazing thing. I think the only thing I talk about like that is Game of Thrones. <laughs> Game of Thrones is pretty spectacular. It I gotta say, spectacular. can't wait till it comes back. I just want the next goddamn book. I know. All right. Well, I haven't read them. 
Sorry. Yeah, you're you're I'm you're not, okay. I'm, I mean, not, you, I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm not sorry. I'm a no, TV. no. You you have nothing to be sorry for. I mean, you know, it's it's the 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 book readers are the ones that are in the shitty situation because now we're watching the TV show for stuff that we don't know what's happened yet. Right. And it's like, and it you know, may or may not happen in the books. Exactly. I have the books. I have them all, and I do plan to read them. But I want to be done with it first. I so, want to get the TV version. Because uh, you know, you know, I can't help but see those characters as they are on the TV show when I read. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I started reading the books during the third season, so I was I was seeing those characters as I okay. read the books. Well, I just want that. I want that whole thing, and then I can judge the differences on my own. Which which there are many, but right, yeah, right, and that's fine. And I want it yeah. to be you know the reading yeah. experience to be different than the TV experience. Oh yeah, I mean it it totally will. Um, because I have so much time to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You would think. My life has got exponentially busier with podcasting, I got to tell you. Well, yeah. I mean, you're doing, what, three, uh, at least three a week? Right now, three, soon to be four. Wow. Impressive. Yeah, Survivor. Survivor's coming soon. <laughs> I, I mean, like, talking, about, like, talking about Walking Dead, talking about Preacher, talking about Game of Thrones, talking about Survivor. It's, it's not hard. No, no, it's, uh, it's this, certainly this not. This one requires work. I have to read. Um, <laughs> fantasy podcast requires work right now, but yeah. it won't so much once the season starts. Yeah. So it, it's all good. Uh, it's a labor of love. Our issues tonight. I think I may have to take these down and edit them together and make one show and re just put it back up because there's a good portion of me stammering by myself. <laughs> it's not pretty. It happens. Thank God nobody's watching. <laughs> yeah hopefully uh in two weeks when we come back we will have uh worked past our technical difficulties and uh we will not have any kind of uh breaks in the episode and maybe you know 15 minute delays i may be able to get a camera by then you can get something pretty a, pretty expensive i got a big september coming up i got a, a music festival i'm going to in uh, the middle of the month and then i'm going to a vikings game nice yeah, I can't wait for that. It's going to be fun. But. I'm, I'm waiting for hockey preseason in September. You guys don't have to kiss. Steve sold his tickets. No, he actually he, he only sold one of his tickets. Oh, he only sold one? I yeah. thought he sold them all. Well, he was... Uh, he If if he couldn't find somebody to buy just one, if somebody wanted to buy the pair, he would have done that, but he did find somebody to buy just one, so he still has one ticket. Oh, good. Yeah. That way you can get the pair occasionally, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and and I'm I'm totally happy with who we sold this ticket to, so we're good. All right, cool. Well, you guys, I know it's not the same. I can't ever watch the Kings because you know they start at seven oh five out there, so it's ten oh five. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not staying up till two to watch a regular <laughs> season hockey game. I don't blame you one bit. You know, I don't see the Angels either, and it really drives <laughs> me nuts. But you guys got Rams fever now. <laughs> Catch it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't care. I know. <laughs> you know what? You know, if if people are happy that football's back in LA, yeah, awesome. You know, that's just one more thing that's gonna help the city out. You just don't care. I don't care. I never really cared about football, but you know, entertainment, that's a whole other story. If this is gonna keep other people entertained, you know, good for that. I'll I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, I've known you for a while and uh hockey has always been your thing. It has. Um so you know that's fine. I, I'm surprised, and you know most most people who read comics and are uh, a little of the uh, geek persuasion, they're not into the sports at all. No, or they're really heavy into them. One of the two. Yeah, and, and so, if you're and if you're talking like geek, you know, geeks and sports, it's like baseball because that's all statistics. You know, that's, that's like a, that's yeah. like a math nerd's dream. Fantasy is like uh, that's the only reason that, that that football season is exciting for me. Mm -hmm. It's because I have a great fantasy football league where, you know, everybody's kind of talks shit and it's kind of like the league. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of modeled after the league and everybody, you know, it participates. Yeah. So that part of it is great. Um, I'm going to miss a lot of football to go to Music Midtown in Atlanta, but I can't get to see the Killers. Nice. That's the, uh, the Killers, uh, Beck, 21 Pilots. Lumineers, um, Alabama Shakes, quite a few bands. Lucius, oh yeah, 
Let's see Lucius, I'm very excited. Nathal, uh, Nathal Radcliffe and the Night Sweats. There's all kinds. Oh, I, 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 I dig the Tanya Ratcliffe Rat, Rat, Rat and the Night Sweats. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. That's going to be a good one. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to see them set them live. You should go to a festival one day. It's amazing. It's craziness. You want to like, well, Bonnaroo, I used to go to Bonnaroo every year. I went six years out of seven. Nice. That's impressive. And, and I, it's, it's, it's a crazy good time. And I've seen, I saw so many bands that I never thought I would ever see, mm -hmm. like Brian Wilson with the Beach Boys and Paul McCartney and Elton John, Billy Joel. I mean, just huge. Like, it would have yeah. cost me a fortune to see all these people. Oh, of course. Paul McCartney, we spent all day on the rail. Uh, we spent 12 hours standing there, no peeing. <laughs> good no peeing. Lord. Uh, That's impressive. We had people bring us corn dogs, and they fought through a, a 50,000 plus crowd to bring us corn dogs. That's some dedication right there. That is dedication and love. But uh, yeah, those things, you can't, you can't beat them. And uh, some of those shows are so amazing that I, I just. It baffles me every time I go to a festival, so yeah. I will continue to go until the day I die. Sounds like a plan. No, not dying. It's not no, dying. not no, the continuing to go. That sounds like a plan. Continuing to go, we will. And uh, this show will continue in two weeks when we will take a look at the boys. And I wish we could I wish we could dole out the comic for free to everybody so they could read it in the next two weeks. <laughs> That would be good. Um, if I put it in my Dropbox and gave everyone the, the address to my Dropbox, could we do that? Not legally. <laughs> Why? We're not distributing it. We're, we're carrying our Dropbox code. This, this is true. I mean, if they're reading it off of your Dropbox, I guess. Um, right. It makes I, you like a library. to download it or anything. Maybe I'm going to look into the legality of that. There you go. Because that would be a nice way to spare the, the, the album of the week that we do with the Monkey Caviar podcast and our mm -hmm. comics we could throw in there. And uh, you just got to get a comic book reader. That's all I use. Yeah. Um, legal issues aside, it's probably totally illegal to do. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably yeah, going to get and a if, if, And if nothing else, if you don't want to read all 72 issues before the, the next episode, read the first trade. I mean, if, if the, the, that first trade really sets up the entire tone of the remainder of the series. Matter of fact, go to your local comic book shop and buy the first trade. Yeah. Support if local business. If they don't have it, tell them to buy it. Tell them to get a copy. They'll get it for you. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for this week's uh, back issues. We're sorry about the technical issues. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'm going to edit it because I know that little spot of me going nuts by myself is should never be seen in public <laughs> but it's kind of you know, i might leave it up just so you can watch it uh let's check it out but all right we'll be back in two weeks with the boys until then love many trust people do harm to no one peace good night